Thanks for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about synthetic sensors, our vision towards general purpose sensing. So this work was done along with my brilliant collaborator, Yang Zhang, and my advisor, Chris Harrison. Let me start by stating that the vision of ubiquitous sensing and smart environments have been sought after for a long time. Lots of people have worked on this uh, to realize this goal. So today, such efforts might fall under names such as the smart home or, more commonly, the Internet of Things. Regardless of these different names, the goals have remained the same over the decades. That is, to apply sensing and computation to enhance the human experience, especially as it pertains to physical contexts and all those amenities with, with, within that context. So with this type of data, users can stay informed and developers can create smart and responsive applications that enhance people's daily routines. There are two ways to achieve this vision today. One is to upgrade one home with smart appliances, microwaves, dishwashers, smart burners, and so on. However, these appliances are expensive and they rarely talk to one another. Rather than working together, these uh, appliances form silos of smartness. A more flexible option is for owners to tag existing uh, facets with aftermarket sensors, as you see here. Um, this adds some level of smartness, but requires many tags, which requires periodic charging, and, so, and they also are socially and aesthetically obtrusive. So what, what if we could use a single, highly capable sensor board that can indirectly monitor an entire room? Is this possible? And how far can we take this idea? That is the core of this talk. Before we dive in, let's, let me quickly first go to related work. There's a lot of rich work in this area, and a full related work review is beyond the scope of our work. But to help illustrate the application landscape, we created what we call a sensor utility taxonomy, as shown here. The y-axis is the number of distinct uh, sense facets, like states or events. And the x-axis is the number of sensors needed to achieve this output. In the next few slides, I'm going to highlight related work using this taxonomy. So the most common form of sensing is to use a single sensor to monitor a single facet of an environment. So one-to-one -one is what we call them. And we call them special purpose sensors as seen here in the left quadrant. For example, a door sensor can only detect you know, when a door is open or closed. Or a water faucet sensor knows when a faucet is running. Again, one-to-one. -one. There's no notion of general, uh, generality. Each facet of interest is monitored by a specific and independent sensor. It's also possible to deploy many sensors in an environment which can be networked together, forming a distributed sensing system. So a distributed sensing system is highly dependent on the quality of the distribution. So one example is a fire alarm. Uh, many sensors in the house, uh, and it detects one thing, fire. Uh, and for that reason, it's a many to one. On the other hand, there are many systems that distribute many sensors that can sense a variety of, of different things. So that's many to many. And that's why the distributed sensing uh, uh, taxonomy side occupies the right half of, of this graph. Uh, to reduce deployment costs and social intrusiveness, researchers have also looked at the idea of installing sensors at key infrastructure probe points. This approach is called infrastructure-mediated sensing. Lots of cool work in this area. So this is more general purpose than the previous approaches, uh, but this technique is still constrained by the class of infrastructure the sensor is coupled to. Right? So for example, uh, a sensor that's attached to plumbing, uh, plumbing can detect the sink or the shower running or the toilet use, but not microwave. So thus, we denote it as a one to few technique. So finally, the, ide uh, the ideal sensing approach uh, occupies the top left of our taxonomy, where one sensor can uh, sense many facets. So this is one to many, which is challenging, but it needs to be indirect to achieve this level of versatility. So computer vision has come closest to achieving this goal. However, cameras have been widely recognized for their pr uh, high privacy intrusion. So it carries with a heavy deployment stigma, especially in people's homes. So armed with this knowledge from related work, we sought to explore how we could build hardware that would serve as a vehicle for our exploration into general purpose sensing. So we surveyed a bunch of sensors using commercial and academic systems. And for our hardware design, we decided to include all of these sensors. It's kind of like an extreme embodiment of all these things. But no camera, as this is particularly sensitive to users. So here's the eventual design of our board and the low-level sensors that we include. This incorporates nine physical sensors able to capture 12 distinct dimensions. Vibrations, acoustics, electromagnetic noise, 
uh, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, illumination, light color, magnetic fields, radio interference, and directional heat. Lots of things packed into one guy. Our sensor board is plug and play. Um, it uses wall power and connects to our cloud backend over Wi-Fi. A single sensor board in a room can capture a wide variety of events, as you see, as you see uh, soon. So we're going to do a live demo. Hopefully it works. Uh, with the Wi-Fi is a little, a little tough right now, but we'll see. Okay. Okay, so let me go over there. So what you're seeing here are the different facets of the signals. There's the uh, accelerometer at the top, uh, the three, top three rows of the accelerometer. Uh, the next one is the microphone, the next one is the EMI, and then all these other sensors, temperature, barometer, light color, illumination, et cetera. And so I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show all these different uh, events running, and we'll see if it can detect the system. So what I, I'm going to walk through here real slowly. What I'm going to like to show you is um, look at the accelerometer on the top, like the top three rows. When I turn on this blender, you can actually see it being activated. And also you can see it, uh, the, our system can detect that it's a blender running. So if I stop that, it should, the, the accelerometer stops and then you can say the blender has stopped running. It's the same thing with the, with the light sensor. If you look at the light color, um, it's not shown. Anyway. Um, you can see that illumination go up, that's because the light is on. And not only that, we can detect both that the light is on and that the blender is running at the same time. So we could do all these different things like, you know, having a coffee writer running, or even like have a microwave running at the same time. Um, it should go. Okay. Um, and then we can also detect things like, you know, this is a mini stove, so if I turn this guy on, um, it should show. You see that little pixel over there at the bottom? That's actually the thermal image, so let me just let this guy in. Oh, this is it, don't worry. <laughs> so see that little guy at the bottom? It's like a little pixel. That's actually this fire right here. Um, and, and the system can detect that the stove is on. So now I can detect that the stove is on, the light is on, the blender is on, and the vacuum is turning all at the same time. <laughs> So I'm really glad my lab demo worked. Thanks for all the guys for, for all your help. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. Okay, I'm gonna play it. All right, whew. These are backup slides. Okay, of course, this low-level sensor data is rarely of interest to users. Instead, we use machine learning to automatically recognize patterns of sensor activation and expose these high-level, uh, as environmental high-level events, such, and we call them synthetic sensors. So let me talk about the featureization and machine learning uh, pipelines in more detail. So first, data comes from a sensor tag that is attached to a power outlet, as you've seen here. Um, and then the board senses several facets, as mentioned earlier, so including vibration, acoustics, EM interference, directional heat, etc. And then we perform onboard featureization. We perform FFTs to our high sampling sensors. We compute statistical features to our low sampling features, and then these features include um, mean, max, standard deviation, centroid, range, sum, et cetera. And next, once that data is packed, we send that over to cloud, uh, over to the cloud with 128-bit uh, uh, AES encryption, and we perform several server-side computations, including trigger detection and feature assembly. And then finally, the feature set is sent to an ensemble classifier. Here we use a classification model, in this case an SVM. In our current implementation, each object or event is modeled with an, its own SVM classifier, and we use the ensemble model to decide which events are triggered. And finally, the output of that process can be used as input for end user applications. So that's the whole system. A different way to look at this is through a system architecture. So you start at the bottom, uh, raw data, and then we featureize and denature things on board and send it to the cloud, and then we perform event classification. Note that uh, raw sensor data is never sent to the cloud. Instead, we featureize it on board, and, uh, and which helps anonymize the signals before transmission. So in addition to denaturing the data, it also means that developers don't need to deal with machine learning or sensors, just the events. Really simple API. Okay. So let me share with you evaluation results really quickly. We explored several key questions to validate the feasibility of synthetic sensors. Um, 
how versatile and generic is our approach? How accurate can the sensors be? And finally, are the signals captured from the environment stable and consistent over time? To answer these questions, we conducted a two-week deployment deployed across a range of environmental contexts, including the kitchen, office, workshop, common area, and the classroom. We placed one sensor per room. So on those five sensor boards, we were able to create 38 synthetic sensors. All of these events manifested some form of physical output that could be sensed. To evaluate signal fidelity and accuracy, we obtained ground truth by manually collecting and annotating data spanning multiple days and locations. So in each test location, we demonstrate a facet of interest. For example, in the workshop, we collect like a laser cutter exhaust running, and then we collect data several times. We collect data every day of the week, so one to seven, and to train our system, we do um, this pattern. Day, tra train on day one, test on day two, train on one and two, test on day three, one, two, three, test on four, et cetera, up to one, one to seven, one to six, test on seven. Um, this simulates learning gains over time. So overall, across all of our synthetic sensors, we achieved an average sensing accuracy of 96%. We also reiterate that a day in this context does not imply a day's worth of data, but simply the demonstrated instances for that day. For example, a few minutes of demonstration. Next, we wanted to test whether the signals are consistent uh, over time, especially because it's possible for environmental facets to change their signals over time. So in addition to collecting data on day one through seven, we also collected data on day 14. Um, this week-long separation is useful, and it's a basic test for signal stability. So overall, across 38 synthetic sensors in five locations, uh, tested a week later, uh, we achieved an average ac accuracy of 98%. So this gives us some understanding that this is stable over time. So you might be wondering which sensors are useful for what synthetic sensor. So we ran that analysis, and here's a table that shows that. For example, the kettle on sensor, half of its merit comes from the thermal channel, the thermal image. For the door sensors, it's an even split between the accelerometer and the microphone. You can dig uh, details of this in the paper. If you're also interested, we have confusion matrices in the paper broken out by location. And here's what the overall learning curves look like for our two-week deployment. Note that by day two, accuracy is already relatively high, 92%. All right, our system works across many different settings. And what you're about to see is a series of examples highlighting the versatility of our approach. For example, this kitchen can detect uh, faucet running or blender on. Can you guys hear the audio? Okay. So when the blender is on, when the coffee grinder is on, or when the burner is uh, running. So if you plug this in a bathroom, we can detect the shower, uh, the two vanity faucets, some bathroom accessories, toilet flushing, or the state of lighting. Uh, we can also detect multiple events in the house, like a, when the fireplace is on. Uh, what, you know, when the water tank is heating or the dryer is running, when the HVAC is on. In the workshop or industrial setting, we can detect multiple events such as when the dust filter is running, when the exhaust fan is on, different tools such as the miter saw, like a shop vac, drill press, grinder, and a bunch of uh, handheld tools. And then in the office, we can also detect a suite of events such as door knock, door closed, when a phone is ringing, when you're writing on a whiteboard, or when you're racing on the whiteboard. Or when you're drinking water in the water fountain, flashing the urinal, or a paper towel dispensed. All right, that's a lot of stuff. Synthetic sensors seen thus far is what we call first-order synthetic sensors. They have learned a particular environmental event and can only detect activations. However, these basic synthetic sensors can go a level higher. We call them second-order synthetic sensors, able to capture higher-level semantics, such as count. So here we can count um, the number of paper towels used. Instead of just the activations, we can actually keep track of that. So here I'm washing my hands. Notice that counter over there in the bottom, it decreases. And then you could do these things to automatically uh, alert restock requests. So the facilities guy could be like, oh, 
you know, paper towel 4471 is, is running out, and then you get an email automatically. In this example, a first order faucet running sensor is used to power a second order water consumption sensor. Metrics like this can inform monitoring behavior change in other applications, so like a water savings challenge on Facebook. You know, you, you can compete with your neighbors in some sense. And finally, you can, uh, first order synthetic sensors can be responsible for recognizing individual states like in this microwave. And by building on top of these uh, sensors, it's possible to create second order sensors that track the state of the microwave. So here, uh, someone's putting uh, something in the microwave, closing the door, look at that state machine over there. It can keep track of what's happening in the microwave. So now it's running, it's looping, and then it's beeping. It's use, it uses the chime to say that the microwave is finished. And then the person opens the door, takes the thing out, and then the system should be able to figure out that the microwave is available again. All right, finally, there's no reason to stop at second order synthetic sensors. These can feed into higher, even higher order sensors able to capture more complex environmental facets like human activity and the mechanical health of objects. Um, like all other techniques, we have limitations, so let me go through them real quickly. Um, of course, we don't have full coverage of our sen uh, synthetic sensors since we rely on the physical manifestations uh, of these events, but we still believe we're making some significant strides towards moving this uh, research field forward. Second, lots of people have, uh, there's lots of events competing for different uh, sensing channels, and so there's always crosstalk. But luckily, there's a lot of events of their own resonant properties and all different acoustic and, and physical properties. So you can still distinguish, but again, you can't avoid collisions if the signals overlap. And finally, we tried our best to denature our data on board, but it's still possible to possibly identify individuals by correlating it with data such as routines and patterns or people's schedules. But we, be because we believe privacy is of utmost importance for technologies like ours, um, we think this, is, this uh, limitation has future potential for future work. All right, that's the end of my talk. I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people, um, including Google, the Giotto IoT Expedition, and the David uh, Packard Foundation, and to all these other guys who've contributed, Robert Chow, uh, Yuvraj, and then uh, Liz and Dorothy Carter. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for all your attention. <laughs> All right, yeah, beautiful work as always, and a live demo. I don't know what to say, speechless. <laughs> Two you. quick questions. One is, how susceptible is it to other background noise? How can it filter out? I mean, some of those were, I can see it can filter out, but I'm imagining you know, you're having a, a big party at your house, now there's a lot of voice conversations, maybe you have a window open, there's sounds from the street. And the second is, is there any training about placement? Because this could be very specific to helping people know the best placement for these, because you're gonna get a better signal, right? Yeah. Very, two very good questions, so let me address them uh, individually. So the first one is about um, noise and background. So uh, one way to do that is to add a lot of um, negative uh, background data, so that's one way to do it. And the other way is because, if you notice, each event has, the, has its own like uh, event signature almost, so some events only trigger the x-axis of the accelerometer, the y-axis of the accelerometer, so those interweaving uh, signatures can help multiplex and at least distinguish and avoid uh, background uh, collisions. But yes, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to get rid of, of all these different collisions. Another way to solve that is to have at least one sensor and another sensor working together to filter out some of the same events. Um, in terms of uh, susceptibility to training, so our idea here is you plug it in and you, uh, it stays there. And if you move it around, there is change in amplitude data because it's weaker, but the frequency data remains mostly similar. So it's a little, it's more robust to moving around, but yeah, you're right, it could still be susceptible to some changes. Thanks for that question. Hi, Edison Thomas from UT Austin. Outstanding presentation, thank you so much. Quick question about training. Um, I got here a little, bit, a little bit earlier and I, and I sat down here and I think I saw you uh, training the system uh, for a little bit of time. So That's can right. you talk a little bit about the process of training? So if I come into a new environment and I bring a whole new device that has a you know, new type of noise, how long does it take for me to train the system to recognize that? Yeah, very good question. So we see three, at least two or three possibilities. One is you, as what you saw, we call it like programming by demonstration basically. So you show the, the sensor something and then you label what that is. And then you, because it has like a high frame rate, you can use this frame, uh, frames captured as the data. So that's one. The other possibility is to use a model which we call like, what was that model? So the sensor just listens uh, passively and something happens and then the 
sensor, like, hey, I saw a, a deviation from the normal. What was that? And then you provide data. And then the third is we, you can uh, use um, machine learning techniques where the sensor just sits there and you do some clustering so that the clusters, the system, if, if it listens for a long time, it can create all these clusters. And once you label one data point from that cluster, you can propagate those levels across. So there's lots of different ways to do this. And then, of course, you can have generalizable models, which you can train from all of their different sources, like videos on the internet or sound or all these different things. Lots of possible ways to improve uh, training and machine learning. Oh, yeah. so, sorry, I got, I think, should we? Should, okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll